please join me in welcoming Ms. Edelman. So glad to see you. And I thank you for choosing a sacred profession that's going to shape the nation um, as we go forward. I'm delighted to be anywhere with Linda Darling Hammond, and I thank your foundation president for that very generous introduction. You've gotten some figures from us, but I want to talk to you about America's fifth child. Now imagine God coming, and every fifth child in America is poor. And Dr. King, on his last day of life, had called to um, his mother to give her his next Sunday sermon title, and it was why America may go to hell. And he said America may go to hell because she's not going to use the vast riches that God's blessed us with to make sure that we deal with all of those within our midst who are poor. And he preached on the last sermon at the National Cathedral before his death on the story of Lazarus and Dives, whom I'm sure we all know. And he said Dives didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he refused to see his brother and to meet his brother Lazarus and with the sores and, and respond to him. And he was afraid America may make the same mistake. But for me, the problem is even worse when we look at that fifth child who is the poorest in America. And the younger our children are, the poorer they are. I'm not talking very well into the mic. OK. And I want to talk about America's fifth child, because one in five children is poor. And if they're black and Latina, and I'll give you, they're even poorer. And half of those children almost are living in extreme poverty. That's unworthy of us, and it's going to be our undoing. The greatest threat to America's national security, military security, and spiritual security is not coming from any enemy without. It's coming from our failure to invest in each of our children. And you are wonderful to have chosen the profession that you have and the calling that you have. And you, other than parents, are going to have the most influence and trying to begin to change these figures. So I just thank you for what you've chosen to do. Um, and how we can, and to talk today about how we can work together because children don't come in pieces. Um, they are, um, in good policy, should be like good parenting. And we should be doing for everybody's children, other people's children, what we want for our own children. And I go wild when people say, well, choose one thing. You want health care or child care or safety or housing or food? You want them all. You want them all. And you need a continuum of care. And each of us has to play our role in seeing that children get what they need to grow into successful adulthood. I mean, just imagine God visiting our very wealthy family, the largest economy in the world, blessed with five children. Four of them have enough to eat and comfortable warm rooms in which to sleep. One doesn't. She's often hungry and cold, and on some nights she has to sleep on the streets or in a shelter, and even taken away from her neglectful family and placed in foster care or group homes with strangers. Imagine this rich family giving four of its children nourishing meals three times a day, snacks to fuel boundless energy, but sending the fifth child from the table into school hungry with only one or two meals and never the dessert that other children enjoy. Imagine this very wealthy and powerful family making sure that four of its children get all of their shots, regular health checkups before they get sick, and immediate access to, act to health care when illness strikes, but ignoring the fifth child who is plagued by chronic respiratory infections and painful toothaches, which sometimes abscess and even kill for lack of a doctor or a dentist. Imagine this family sending four of their children to good, stimulating schools, preschools, and making sure they have music and swimming lessons after school, but sending the fifth child to unsafe child care with untrained caregivers responsible for too many children, or leaving that fifth child occasionally with an accommodating relative or neighbor or older sibling, or even alone. Imagine four of the children living in homes with books and families able to read to most of their children every night, but leaving the other fifth child unread to, untalked, and unsung, and unhugged, or propped before a television screen or a video game that feeds him violence and sex and racially and gender-charged messages, intellectual pablum interrupted only by ceaseless ads for material things beyond the child's grasp. Imagine this family sending some of its children 
to high quality schools and safe neighborhoods with enough books and computers and laboratories and science equipment and well prepared teachers and sending the fifth child to a crumbling school building with peeling ceilings and leaks and lead in the paint and asbestos and old, old books and not enough of them. And teachers untrained in the subjects they teach and with low expectations that all children can learn, especially the fifth child. And imagining mo imagine most of the family's children being excited about learning and looking forward to finishing high school, going to college and getting a job and the fifth child falling further and further behind grade level, not being able to read, wanting to drop out of school, and being suspended and expelled at younger and younger ages because no one has taught him to read and compute or diagnosed his attention deficit disorder or treated his health and mental health problems and help him keep up with his peers. Imagine four of the children in this very powerful, wealthy nation engaged in sports and music and art and after school and summer camps and in enrichment programs and the fifth child hanging out with peers are going home alone because mom and dad are working or in prison or they've run away from their parenting responsibilities and escaped in drugs and alcohol. And contrary to popular stereotype, America's fifth child is more likely than not to have a family member in the workforce but those children too may be left alone because of the inadequate childcare system we have or out on the streets with peers during the non-school hours with much idleness and weeks and months in the summer and be at risk of being sucked into illegal activities in the prison pipeline or killed by a gun saturated nation that kills, a gun kills a child in America every, or injures a child, kills or injures a child every half hour. There is, you know, our children are 17 times more likely to be killed by guns than children in a comparable industrialized nation. What is it with us and gun violence that is really destroying the lives of so many and among black children? 17 times more black children have died from guns over the last 50 years than have, were lost in all the lynchings in American history of black people. What is it that allows us to continue to normalize violence and to glorify violence and to continue the saturation of our culture with guns? This is our American family today, where one in five of our children lives in poverty in the richest nation on earth, and six and a half million of them, the 14, 15 million children, 14.9 to be precise, live in extreme poverty, or less than half the poverty level. It is not a stable or a healthy or an economically sensible or a just family. Our failure to invest in all of our children before they get sick or drop out of school and get into trouble, I believe is morally indefensible and extremely costly. Many years ago, we did a book called Wasting America's Future, and Bob Solo, the Nobel laureate economist from MIT, estimated at that time that having 14 million children be poor in America cost our country a half trillion dollars each year in foregone productivity and crime and other dependency costs. It's a costly thing morally, but it's a costly thing economically to let children be poor and to be uneducated and to not have the basic health care and early childhood foundation that almost every other industrialized nation does. I don't know what it's going to take to get us to our senses, but we are cutting our own noses off our own faces. Black and Hispanic children are at far greater risk of being poor and of entering what we at CDF call the cradle to prison pipeline. The most dangerous place for a child to grow up in America today is still at the intersection of race and poverty, despite the extraordinary racial progress we have made, despite um, the number of black elected officials and what has happened over the last years and a black president in the White House, black children are still at the bottom. They are the poorest children in America. After an enormously transforming civil rights movement, um, they're at the bottom. And on our watch, we are letting them slide backwards and we need to stop it. We all need to really begin to confront our birth defects in this country and to really deal with the deep-seatedness still of race because these defects, if you don't see them and honestly discuss them and try to provide re responses, will keep flaring up 
And while our country had the right dream and aspirations to be a place for, where a level playing field would exist for everybody, and which recognized before God people were sacred and had a right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, we had a few major things. That was the rhetoric, that was the right dream, but then it was based on Native American just, ge genocide, um, slavery, exclusion of all women from the electoral process, and exclusion of all non profited men, white, black, Latina, and everybody else. And we have been struggling over our history to try to begin to deal with these birth defects, so they keep flaring up unless we kind of pull them up and see them. Um, and we've gone through a civil war. We went through a post-Civil War reconstruction period, then we went back through a resegregation period, um, and the loss of the progress in the reconstruction era. And then we went through a civil rights movement to try to begin to make another spurt forward or to weed out some of these defects. And now I fear with all the, the demographics and with the, is the, the things that you're hearing and the conditions that we see every day and with the cradle prison pipeline that traps one in three black boys born in 2001 is gonna go to prison in his lifetime if we don't disrupt it and replace it with a pipeline to college and, and jobs and successful careers and work one in six Latino boys. And I fear with the range of things that are going on in this country now, despite the enormous progress that we've made, that we may well be entering a post-reconstruction, a new, a new apartheid era, because I believe that mass incarceration is um, the new apartheid, the new resegregation that's gonna undo us. And your role as educators can have a key, key role in breaking that up. Um, and I want to come back to that, and we can discuss that. But we have got to deal with the incarceration issue and with the fact that minority children and children of color, who are now going to be the majority, they're now already a majority of our twos and unders, um, are the fodder for that pipeline. What is a child going to do if they um, get into the prison system early or into the juvenile detention system early and, and are just moving on to the adult criminal system? But the problem is that education in schools are one of the major feeder systems into that pipeline, and we have the power to change it. I want to talk about that in just a minute. But so many, and again, when I talk about race and poverty being that dangerous intersection, so many of our poor babies in this very rich nation enter the world with multiple strikes against them, which is why children can't be looked at as coming in pieces without prenatal care at low birth weight, and we're making great progress. 95% of all children now have access to health care, but access is not actual health care. And when I come to my end, and I'm talking about the five things we can all do together, um, one of them is helping enroll children in school systems because it's an education issue. The kids can't see the teacher, can't hear the teacher, has an undiagnosed attention deficit disorder. That child's not going to learn. It's going to be a discipline problem. So all of us have a self-interest in making sure that children are healthy and that their mental health needs are also addressed. But they're born without prenatal care, without with low birth weight, sometimes and often, too often, to a teen, a poor and poorly educated single mother, an absent father, and at crucial points in their development from before birth, and until adulthood, more risk kind of pile on, making a successful transition to productive adulthood significantly less likely, and involvement in the criminal justice system significantly more likely. One in four of our black children is poor, and the younger our children, one in four of our preschool children is poor. The younger a child is, the poorer they are in America during their years of greatest brain development. And I hope all of us at NEA, with all of your cloud, we're all going to join together and do what every other comprehensive industrialized country does. We're going to get an early childhood, a quality early childhood system in place to get every child ready for school, beginning with home visiting. We've made incremental progress. The president has put in a strong start bill, a $90 billion investment over 10 years to talk about home visiting um, and expanding Head Start, quality Head Start, and early Head Start, and having universal pre-K system. I'm also for a universal K system where we're going to have common core standards, and I'm for lifting the quality. Then you've got to make sure the children are prepared to meet those standards. And so I hope that we can all work together on this foundational education program and make sure that we have quality early childhood education in this country. Every other sensible industrialized nation, far less wealthy than we do, has that in place. 
I am deeply, deeply concerned about the status of the black child, though. Um, and a great number of our states, 40% or more, are poor. Um, and in about six states, half of them are poor. And we have got to see them, and black child or black children are nine times more likely to live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty than white children, and the average wealth of white households is 17 times that of black households. When one looks at achievement levels and the crucial role that education plays, the fact is about 60% of all of our children in fourth and eighth grade cannot read at grade level. 75% of Latino children cannot read at grade level in fourth and eighth grade. And over about 80%, and I've just come back from Mississippi, 89% of the black children in that state, which helped transform America, cannot read or compute at grade level in fourth or eighth grade. What is a child going to do in this globalizing world, in this competitive economy, without an ability to read and write it's so, it's just, it, and compute? It's so basic. And so we've really got to focus in on that because if we don't teach them how to read and write, they're going to be sentenced to the prison pipeline. The average literacy level in the Mississippi prison system that is just filled um, with black boys and black men, many of them on drug, drug, drug use charges and the unequal enforcement of drug laws is palpable, but their average literacy level is fifth grade. What are they going to do when they get out of prison with a prison record but also unable to get jobs and jobs are not there and we've got to talk about how we create jobs and just imagine how many new jobs would be created if we put into place a $90 billion early childhood program. We've got to get public sector jobs on the agenda because people need to work and they need to see hope. And we could solve a lot of our children's problems by investing in these programs like early childhood and comprehensive health centers and school-based clinics and create jobs as well as meet the needs of children. Um, we've got to deal with child poverty with a sense of urgency and we've got to really look at the entire child and I want to talk about what we can do to make sure that our children can have hope. The first thing um, is to just recognize, and I say this all the time, and again, I think you have such, you've chosen to do the most important thing other than parenting um, in America and molding um, the fate of children, is to recognize that God did not make two classes of children and that every child is sacred. And when you go into that classroom in the morning, try to remember that, and it's hard. I mean, I understand that you're dealing with a lot of very complicated projects, but remember the sacredness of your task and what influence you're going to have to shape that child's future. You've got to have high expectations for every child. You've got to, because children, you can't fool children. Um, you, they, they can smell, you can have the fanciest classrooms, the best equipment in the world, the best staff laboratories in the world. But if you don't love those children and understand and respect those children, they'll, they'll, they'll sense it in a minute. And we really have got to remember the sacredness and the importance of our task. And I'm sure that most of us do on some days, just as most parents, including me, do on some days, even when their children are very complicated. But, it's, but, but, but hang in there. It's not easy, but hang in there and try to see the whole child and remember it. the child is the point of the school, not adult convenience. Not adult jobs, it's the child. And you're molding the future of the nation, and I can't tell you how many times I want to say how grateful I am that you've chosen this sacred mission and profession. But just always keep, I tell my staff at CDL, keep the baby in the middle of the table when you're making all kinds of decisions. Stick him there and stick her there and the poorest and most vulnerable child. And is this policy that you're proposing going to help that baby? Not whether you're going to be able to raise money off of it, not whether it's politically popular. Is it good for the child? And so you've chosen the right profession, so just try to remember in those very frustrating days. Secondly, I hope that we can work together in addressing the needs of the whole child. I want to come back to child health and child nutrition because we've got over a million children. Homelessness is growing. And just imagine what it'd be like in a homeless shelter. Um, day in and come into your classroom and they haven't eaten, they've had all this noise and the things that they're exposed to is just unbelievable. Um, and so it's going to be difficult for you if they're acting out, but think about what they're coming with and try to begin to get that second breath and, 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 and help deal with it. But keep the child before you. Hunger is just still a problem. We have made enormous strides in hunger, but I just came back from Mississippi and hunger is back 
um, rampantly um, across Mississippi, and sometimes it manifests itself as obesity. Your school lunch and your school breakfast programs are terribly important, but I hate to read some of the reports I get from my state offices on Monday morning when a child misses, the bus is late, and they miss breakfast on Monday morning, and they cry. And so that the school can't simply say that's a family responsibility, we've got to figure out how to deal with this basic survival need of our children, and I worry particularly about what happens to our poorest children when, summer, when school is out. And there's a 90% drop in the food summer program, the summer feeding program. What do they do all summer? And they are hungry, and we're now going to retrace Robert Kennedy's um, steps in knocking on the empty doors, finding people with no income, and there are six million Americans right now in the latest data that have no cash income. And the only thing keeping the wolves from the door um, are food stamps. And many of the people have to use their food stamps or trade their food stamps to keep the lights on and to keep the heats on. But then what happens in the summer? And so the second thing I really want us to all think about is how do we begin to work together to ensure a food safety net? I don't understand why if you've got 100% federal funding program for summer food, we can't get the bureaucracy to, 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 to ease up and to figure out ways to do it, but I think that we've got to make more and more partnerships and more schools are beginning to try to seal how they can stay open in the summers to feed these children. We should not have hungry children in America, and we should not have millions of hungry children in America. That's an education issue. It's a basic decency issue, and I hope we can work together on how we can make sure that, I know many of you are doing lunch pack things and backpack things on weekends, um, though I do also hear that some rich school districts have stopped doing even school lunches because most of the affluent children bring their own lunches, and so you've got pockets of hunger even in some of our richest districts. Well, we've got to deal with hunger. It's an education issue, and it's unworthy of us as Americans, and we need to figure out how we can work together and make a mighty noise to say surely we can figure out how we're going to get children not only enough food, but good food and healthy food, because obesity is a new manifestation of that. Secondly, how do we work together to get health care? so that you don't have children sitting who can't hear you or can't see you or who can't focus or concentrate or have attention deficit disorders. Um, and I'm just very pleased that we've been working with ASA, uh, the, the American School Administrators Association, with a number of school districts around the country. We began in Texas, just having in Houston them ask questions on the first day, are you, is your child covered by health insurance? Do you have private insurance? Or do you know about CHIP and Medicaid? And we had enormous success in Texas in enrolling hundreds of thousands of children in health care, and it is making a difference. And through the Atlantic Philanthropies Grant, we are now working with school districts in several other states to enroll children in health care. Um, and I just hope that that can become a partnership that we can work out with in more schools, because it, it, they're not going to learn if they are hurting or if they, are, they can't see or can't hear. And I'd love to talk about that, and I hope we can work with you to extend CHIP, because CHIP funding expires. Um, the Child Health Insurance Program um, next year, and we need to get it reinforced this year, and I just hope that we won't move backwards. We've had huge success in getting millions of children um, eligible for health care. The 5% the of the, of the, and the 95%, the 5% um, that is missing in our enrollment of children who are eligible, and not enrollment in our eligibility um, for, for health care, are our immigrant children. And I keep telling everybody a child's a child, and a child who's not healthy or not immunized is a, is a threat to all of us. But at any rate, let's keep CHIP, and I hope that we can work together on both enrolling at the local level, but at the same time trying to make sure that we get CHIP re-enrolled. Third, I really do hope that we can all work together in thinking anew about school discipline policies, and particularly zero tolerance school discipline policies. Um, I am. Um, our first report as a Children's Defense Fund was on children out of school in America, and it came out in 1974. And I want to just read to you what we found. We had looked at the census data and found there were 2 million children not enrolled in any school, and 750,000 of them between 7 and 13 years old. And I couldn't figure out why would 750,000 children between 7 and 13 be out of school. So we knocked on thousands of doors in 30 census tracts. And what we found is that 750,000 children are mostly children with disabilities, emotional, mental, and physical. And so our first act 
um, nationally was to work together with the coalition of, of disability groups, um, children, parents who had disabled children, um, and with coalitions, and George Miller came to town the same time that we did, um, and we were able to get 94-142, and then, the, which is now the Individual Disabilities Act, and we've made great progress, but we still have a long way to go. But we also found extraordinary things about school discipline and the children were being expelled for truancy and tardiness and catch-all terms like disruption. Now, I just have to tell you, I don't understand how if a child is not coming to school that the antidote is to put him out of school and that there are really long-term problems that come from that. And we found the largest number of uninsured of, of children who are out of school in two all-white census tracts in Portland, Maine. And for catch-all terms, the, 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 the suspension route um, problem had a huge contributing factor to that. And so we called then, and I want to tell you what we said about what we found about why children are being excluded, which is why I constantly say not two classes of children, really think about it. And as we now are having these changing demographics, we need to do that. But what we found in children out of school was that if children, a child was not white, or was white but not middle class, didn't speak English, is poor, needs special help with seeing, hearing, walking, reading, learning, adjusting, growing up, was pregnant or married at age 15, was not smart enough, or was too smart, school was not the place for that child. Out of school children shared a common characteristic of differentness by virtue of race, income, physical, mental, or emotional handicap, and age. They are for the most part out of school not by choice, but because they have been excluded. It is as if many school officials have decided that certain groups of children are beyond their responsibility or, and are expendable. Not only do they exclude these children, they frequently do so arbitrarily, discriminatorily, and with impunity. If a child's not coming to school, I think we should find out why he's not coming to school and, and, and work it out. And I think that I'm not, and, and, and the catch-all terms of disruption and things like that um, need to be looked at um, and the application of, of, of school discipline policies against largely black boys and children with special need needs to be looked at. But I just want to say we need to stop the feeder system from the schools to the juvenile justice system to the adult criminal system. And if children are engaged in having fun learning, and if we have thoughtful restorative justice practices, I was very struck back then, I could not find one entry in the Harvard Graduate School of Education um, on school discipline. Um, and I really think that this is a time now because of the tragedy of, of over-incarceration of children and the role that school suspensions and expulsions play in that um, in excluding children from school. Um, we need to break that tie. And there are a number of wonderful models, restorative justice models that are going on, but we need to talk about alternatives. We need to keep our children in school and to keep them stimulated. And I don't know that there's anything that can make me believe that four-year-olds should be expelled. Um, we've got to be able to figure out how we keep our children in schools. And there are a number of things in process now. I'm very grateful that a number of school districts and others are beginning to reconsider this. But I just hope that everybody will think about the implications. And we're also working with a number of unions to train security guards in these schools um, and let them understand the implications when they hand out a ticket for truancy or for tardiness. And the implications of that is going to be for that child staying or not staying in the school. So I hope that we can work together on, on more enlightened and positive school discipline problems and break that tie between schools and the juvenile justice system. Um, I hope we can also work together, and as we are with a number of school districts, on summer learning loss. Um, and one way we can get around the hunger of children in the summer, and we have 202 freedom schools, which are summer schools with wonderful books that are taught by college students from the communities where these children are growing up. And I want to tell you that a huge number of the black and, and about a third, 90% are black and Latino, and about a third are black and Latino males, and many of them are changing their majors to go into teaching after having experience with these children in the summer freedom schools. And the children are beginning to learn that there's something called college um, in, their, in their future, not just prison in their future, by having people who've gone through the same things they have in their own community, who come in with enormous energy and understanding and ability to listen. And the freedom schools, which come out of the summer project of Mississippi, we put a really rigorous literacy curriculum underneath it, terrific books that give children hope and they can see themselves in it. 
I mean, we're going to do a major symposium and freedom school training at the Alex Haley Farm, which is our movement building school, next summer, and I hope you'll come the first week in June, on cultural diversity and racial diversities in books, but our children are finding that reading is fun. Um, and who says that learning cannot be fun? most of the time. And, and so I, the Summer Freedom Schools has been a really important thing, and I love it because it is making a difference in stopping summer learning loss, and we know about that. Um, and it's like those of us who have uh, privileges can send our kids to the best camps and, and enrichment activities. But they also work everywhere, and they are run in large part by college students, but we have nine, we have 14 this summer in secure juvenile detention facilities. Because in addition to working to make sure that children, the, the schools don't feed into the juvenile justice system, we're trying to make sure that we stop at the juvenile justice system and don't have them automatically go on to adult prison. We have them in homeless shelters. We have them with public schools in a number of places, and I love it. Um, and I hope that we can begin to collaborate more and engage more public schools. And we have a number at HCBUs, or historically black colleges, at mainstream universities like Duke and Davidson College and the State University of New York. But I hope we can look together to see how we might partner further in trying to make sure that children have positive alternatives to the street in the summer. I also hope we can work together on trying to talk about equal, equal funding for all of our schools. We, our first report before we became a children's defense fund was on Title I and is it helping poor children? And the answer was no. We examined all the audit files and then HEW and found that money was going to almost everybody except poor schools, children in poor schools. And my favorite example, what my least favorite example, was that they'd built some, a swimming pool in suburban Memphis with Title I money, but the formulas have become even more unequal under, under, over time. And we all need to work together to make sure that poor children are getting a fair shake from our funding streams at the federal level. Lastly, I just want to come back to just the importance of what we're doing. Um, I want to just, my sister sent me an old clipping about everything you need to know in life you can learn from Noah's Ark, and um, it was from some anonymous fella. And the first thing he said was that, don't miss the boat. <laughs> and the country is going to miss the boat if we don't educate our children. We are lagging behind many other industrialized countries, and we are going to miss the boat if we don't invest in them first, not last. And we do not have a money problem in America. We have a valleys and priorities problem. We've got to educate our children and fund education in early childhood. <laughs> the second lesson from this anonymous sage was that we're all in the same boat. And we may not like these poor children who are of color and who have come to all these, come to schools with all their problems. But they're our children, and they're going to be a majority of our public school children in a few years. They're already a majority of our uh, under twos. I want them to be educated to support my social security system and my Medicaid secure system, and I don't want to be supporting them in prison. States are investing, on average, three times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That's a really dumb investment policy, folks. And so we need to reverse that. We can't afford that. We need to not only affirm the sacredness of every child, but understand the common senseness of invested. Thirdly, he said, don't um, you know, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And we are a very short-term, quick-fix culture, the next quarter. Um, these children today are the workforce tomorrow, or the prisoners of tomorrow. And look at the, at, at the responsibility and the opportunity you hold in your hands to shape the future of America. The fourth lesson was don't be criticized. Noah wasn't popular, they thought he was crazy. But if you don't wanna be criticized, don't do anything, don't say anything, and don't be anything. And I just hope that we will be willing to kind of get out of our comfort zones in really talking about the need to make education, and early education, and children first, not last, um, in our budget priorities and in our nation's priorities. But my favorite, I'm not going to go through all seven of the lessons, but my last one I want to mention because I think we have to have a movement and all of us have to be a part of it and it has to be focused on children and ending child poverty in the richest nation on earth. And the one I love the most is to remember that um, um, the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic by experts. <laughs> Everybody seems to be waiting around for Dr. King to come back. He's not coming back. Dr. King never led a movement in his life. He didn't spark them. He came and he embodied it. Movements and transforming change comes from all of us coming together around 
an overarchingly important cause and our children are that overarching important cause. And I just hope that we can work together, keeping them on the, mid the middle of the table, and figure out how we're going to make sure that we give them all health care in the world's biggest economy, that we speak out to end child poverty, and we're going to be issuing a report at the end of this year on ways we can end child poverty based on what we're already doing, just investing more, and it's not a token of what we're spending in the military, or not a token of what the top 1% and the top one half of 1% are getting, we don't have a money problem, but we have a voice problem and an organization problem and an insistence problem. Um, and we've got to reorder these priorities if America really is not going to fulfill Dr. King's very scary priority. I also hope that we can just end with a prayer because I, my favorite introduction ever was by a former school superintendent, state superintendent of education in um, North Carolina. And he shared with me, and I now try to share it with everybody I can, a prayer by my friend Anna Hughes, and I want to just end with that, um, just to keep you going on days when you really want to throw in the towel, and you're very frustrated, and you think nobody appreciates you. Just really, really keep yourself grounded in the sacredness of your task and the absolute essentialness of your task as you're trying to prepare this country for the next era and to compete with increasingly um, um, challenging competitors. And so let's just think about the children when they're acting out in class and let's see if you remember these children. And she let me play around with some of her words. Her name is Anna Hughes and she was a reporter for the Knoxville Times. And, but this is a wonderful thing about, again, all children being our own. And this is called a prayer for all children. We pray for children and accept responsibility for children who sneak popsicles before supper who race holes in math workbooks and who can never find their shoes. But we also will pray and stand up for and accept responsibility for children who can't bound down the street in a new pair of sneakers, who are born in places we wouldn't be caught dead and who never go to the circus and live in an X-rated world. Let's pray and accept responsibility and teach with love those children who hug us in a hurry in our own homes and forget their lunch money but let's also pray and speak up for and protect those children who never get dessert, who have no safe blanket to drag behind them, who don't have any rooms to clean up, whose pictures aren't on anybody's dresser, and whose monsters are real. Let's teach and pray and respect those children who spend all of their allowance before Tuesday, throw tantrums in the grocery store, pick at their food like ghost stories, who shove dirty clothes under the bed and never rinse out the tub who get visits from the tooth fairy, don't like to be kissed in front of the carpool, who squirm in church and temple and scream on the phone, whose tears we sometimes laugh at, and whose smiles can make us cry. But let's also recommit in the wonderful choices we've already made to be a teacher or an administrator or an educator, to pray and accept and hang in there with children whose nightmares come in the daytime, who lead anything who've never seen a dentist or a doctor, who aren't spoiled by anybody, who go to bed hungry and cry themselves to sleep, who live and move but have no being. Let's pray and accept responsibility and build a movement to invest in all of our children, those who want to be carried and those who must be carried, those we never give up on but those who don't get a second chance for those we smother and for those who will grab the hand of anyone kind enough to offer it. Your choice of profession, your choice of mission and work has already sort of made you take a side. Um, and I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. And I do hope that we together are going to come together and form that next transforming movement. My first visit to Washington was to set up an office for the Poor People's Campaign for Dr. King and he was coming and he got assassinated as we know and the riots broke out all across the country and I went out into the schools here in Washington DC over near U Street and tried to talk to the kids and tell them not to get into trouble, not to riot, not to steal, not to loot because they would ruin their future. And one little boy about 12 looked me straight in the eye and said, lady, what future? I ain't got no future. I ain't got nothing to lose. And we have yet to answer that boy's indictment. Um, and our militarily rich 
and economically rich and yet too spiritually poor nation. It is going to be our undoing. But you and I have the power to change that. And we are going to change that. And we're going to work together and keep children at the middle of the table to change that. And we're going to make children, not jobs, not anything else, not our convenience, not our fatigue. We've got to keep children there. And that is doing God's work. And that is saving the future of this country. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart.